Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. It's been a while since I made a video and this is mostly because I've been swamped at work and haven't had any time to spend in the lab. But not to worry, I have planned some really cool videos and including uh, reviews and repairs and tutorials for the end of the year that I'm sure you would enjoy. So keep an eye on the website. Today we're going to talk about something really fun and simple. We're going to talk about the SparkFun ESP8266 thing. And this revolves around the Internet of Things. What is this whole idea about anyway? Well, Internet of Things refers to our ability to be able to put a sensor that has microprocessor in it and is connected to the Internet on pretty much everything we use on a daily basis. And this can be your toaster, your mailbox, your doorknob, it doesn't matter. And they will all be connected to the Internet. This brings up a whole new possibility of having all these devices interconnected through the crowd and accessible from anywhere in the world. Of course, there are security concerns and other things that come with it, but the opportunity and the possibilities are amazing. So why are we talking about this now? I mean, Internet's been around for a very long time. So why is Internet of Things all of a sudden such a big deal? Well, as always, it's a law of economics. Nowadays, pretty much anybody can make a, a medium performance, low performance front end radio in the ISM band, meaning that anyone can make a Wi-Fi chipset at a fraction of a the cost. They're so easy to make, they're just like transistors essentially. Even fabulous Chinese companies are able to produce radios that connect to microprocessors. And this is why it's become such a big deal because it's now so cheap, like pennies, uh, to be able to have a full radio with memory, uh, microprocessor, everything, all including the antenna connected to something. And this is basically what this is. This is based on the ESP8266 chipset that you can buy for a couple of dollars. This module itself with the battery charge and all flash memory and of course the cost of PCB and all that was I think about $15 from SparkFun and I got interested in trying it out for a while so I've been playing with it and it's really cool to use. Of course you can download libraries, program them, play around with it but you know that I'm against that. We want to understand what's going on and what exactly is happening on this board. So we're going to take a look at the board closely. We're also going to take a look at the data sheet of this part and understand uh, what is actually in it. Then I have it connected up to the internet and I can control it uh, through my cell phone using an app called Blink and Blink is a cloud-based service which can connect directly to this. One of the one of the amazing thing about this thing is that it is also Arduino compatible. For so all of you guys who love Arduino, you have all the libraries available and you can program it just like that. Pretty easy, pretty amazing and a lot of the hard work has already been done by the people who've written the libraries as well as the apps that run on the cell phone. So let's go ahead Take a close look at this, look at the data sheet, and we'll build it step by step. And I have written some software. I'm going to go through it with you step by step through the code and make the code available to you. And I can't wait to see what you guys can do with it. And here's a close look at the board. And you can see how incredibly simple it is. On the right side, we have a micro USB connector, which is used in nothing else but to just charge the uh, lithium polymer battery. And here's a lithium polymer battery connector. All the charging circuitry is right over here. There are two LEDs, one showing that it's being charged, and then the other one is just a power on and off status of the board. And there's one other LED over here, which is connected to one of the IO uh, pins of the IC itself. And the charging circuitry, we're gonna take a look at uh, the schematic of that. There's an on and off switch, and there's a few unpopulated components here and these are actually light sensors and temperature sensors uh, which SparkFun has uh, put into the schematic and on the layout and you can populate them if you want to add them directly to the board but unfortunately they're not there which is a shame I would have liked to at least have the option of having those populated here's a flash memory here 4 megabit which is directly connected to the IC itself as well to the ESP8266 and this handles the uh, programming memory and all that this is a SPI flash component here's a 26 megahertz crystal right here a few passives mostly decoupling and so on and of course we have uh, the input output uh, of the ICDRF directly through a decoupling capacitor, so it's AC coupled and then goes through a zero ohm resistor to the antenna and the antenna is right here under the SparkFun logo made up of the traces and the top layer uh, of the PCB itself. Pretty straightforward, really standard technique. Uh, to be used for ultra low cost because it's part of the PCB itself. You can also flip this resistor to the other side and have a micro FL connector if you want to have an external uh, antenna uh, which is, may not be shielded and so on because in case if you put this in a metal box or it's underground or something but it doesn't have a very good reception you can have an external antenna that way. And all the IO ports are taken out over here you can see that it has I squared C interfaces, it has uh, RS232 interface, it has a, a single port ADC, and of course it has uh, IO ports which we can use and they're all PWM enabled and so on. So it's incredible. This is all on, of course on one, one layer, there's nothing on the other side of the board. 
and uh, if you were to make a two layer board this would be tiny a fraction of the size this is just made very large because it's intended for prototyping so let's go ahead and take a look at the schematic of this so we understand exactly how everything is connected to it we'll take a look at the data sheet a few of these components and then uh, we'll see what we can do with it and here's a picture of what we were just looking at and all the different IOs are nicely labeled over here. And the schematic of it is drawn by SparkFun. Again, very nicely drawn, very easy to follow. So I recommend you take a look at it as well. I'm going to go through it and show the different block diagrams. I might be talking a little bit fast, so I apologize, but feel free to pause it and go back and this allows you to listen to it, hopefully more than once if, uh, if something is lost. So at the top left, we have the USB port. This is what's giving us the five volt directly from the PC that you'll be using. And the data lines of the USB port are connected to nothing in this version. There is another version of this port that has an FTDI chipset directly on it, but then it doesn't have the battery charger, which is unfortunate. I don't see why they can't have both of those at the same time. The lithium ion battery charger is an MCP73831 chip, and this is an intelligent charger which you can set the voltage that you want the battery to be charged to, and then switch between constant current and constant voltage, and we'll take a look at that. The output of that, which would be the battery voltage, is connected to an AP2112K, which is a fixed 3.3 volt linear regulator. This entire section then makes up the power generation of the board and provides the 3.3 volt uh, to all the components that are on this uh, little PCB. And you can see the different power on LED, the charge LED, all of them uh, nicely on this little section. So let's take a look at this chip over here. And here's the block diagram of the lithium polymer battery charger. Very standard, you can see the battery voltage connected over here. We have the transistors here uh, that control the current flow in and out of the device. There's a reference generator directly on the IC, which then you can program uh, the uh, programming voltage of the battery itself using program uh, port over here and resistor. Even 50 millivolt makes a really big difference. 50 millivolt difference in the maximum charge voltage of the lithium polymer can um, adversely affect uh, the lifespan of the battery. So even 50 millivolt is important that's why they have to have a uh, precise reference uh, directly on the IC and this then will switch between constant current and constant voltage as to be expected and now going back over here as I was saying the linear, linear regulator is very very straightforward here's the input voltage coming directly from the battery and that will then go through the output MOS transistor whose gate voltage we are adjusting and the output is then taken from the other port of the transistor and there's a resistor divider over here and that voltage is then fed back onto a comparator which then compares with respect to a reference voltage generated directly on the IC and that's how you can set the voltage depending on the values of these resistors you can set the voltage at the output to be anything that you want in the adjustable version now you have that port uh, you can use external resistors to set the voltage to whatever you, uh, you desire and there's going to be some dropout voltage associated with that and so on which I'm not going to get into I've built this type of linear regulators uh, on my channel before so feel free to go back and take a look this is a negative feedback and there is also shutdown logic and stuff that detects whether the output is shorted and that will then disconnect this transistor from here and then it will uh, prevent any damage to be done this is not a switching transistor of course this is a linear regular the transistor operates in a linear region and this means it's going to be quite nice and low noise. Now going back to the schematic, on the right side over here we have the temperature, light sensor and then the authentication chipset which are unfortunately not populated but you could populate them. They all share the same I2C bus so they all going to have independent addresses and you can program them directly from the IC because the I2C interface of the IC is available to you. And at the bottom here we have the different headers so the different IOs coming out uh, which are accessible. The uh, I2C interface, again, as I was saying, is also accessible to you, all of those uh, which we will take a look at. And of course, here on the left, we have the ESP8266 and the 4 megabit of flash memory. That flash memory is an SPI memory, so it occupies the SPI interface of the IC itself, and we can take a look at that as well. Here's the block diagram for it. Very straightforward. The interface logic controls the SPI interface, plus the chip select, write enabled, and all the other uh, different IOs that are required to write, write to flash memory. The entire core flash memory is right over here. We have X and Y decoders to access the flash memory matrix. There's an SRAM buffer. It's also very typical because you need an SRAM buffer in order to uh, synchronize the access to the flash memory. So that the, the data is buffered to the SRAM and that, that, that way it can be accessed and read in and out uh, while the uh, flash memory might be busy because it's much slower in order to write what you uh, need to write to it. There's address latches and all, all the other protection logic and so on really really straightforward 
and of course in the center then we have the ESP8266 you can see the output here is labeled as LNA but the reality is LNA and the PA and I'll talk about that in a second there is a little bit of a few components actually the uh, inductors are not populated there is a 5.6 picofarad of AC coupled uh, capacitor I'm not sure if that's entirely part of the matching network or not but indeed is necessary to AC couple the output of the LNA and the PA and it goes into two paths and this resistor over here is do not populate and that's where the micro FL connector comes in and this antenna over here is the trace that is directly on the PCB uh, itself the crystal uh, oscillator right over here 26 megahertz directly connected to the IC as well so now if you go ahead and take a look at the block diagram and a little bit of a system specification of this chip there's a lot of cool things we can learn just by looking at the block diagram and here it is the block diagram of the SOC which is the uh, system on a chip for this entire IC and the reason they call it a system on a chip because it has both the radio and the baseband and the processor and the physical Mac layer all directly uh, on the IC this is manufactured in a CMOS process I'm not sure what technology node but probably not a very advanced one because you, you really don't need a very advanced CMOS node for ISM bands and you can see here the antenna directly connected to a ballon this ballon they call it an RF ballon so I assume it's an active single little differential converter circuitry I don't think it's purely passive and then they connect the, the directly connect that to a solid state switch and that transmit receive switch is used to switch the antenna connected to either the RF receive section which would be the LNA and the VGA or the RF transmit section which would be the power amplifier and the, the gain control that falls right behind it so the LNA and the PA chain the RF sections are directly connected to the mixers as to be expected and the output of the mixers are connected to some analog transmit and receive basically the analog baseband section that controls the gain in the baseband and controls the gain in the baseband and the transmit section as well as far as the clock generation goes they have a PLL and a VCO so they have an entire PLL it's a little bit unusual to put the VCO outside of the PLL but the idea is very clear and this PLL VCO then locks to the channel that is desired in the ISM band in the 2.4 gigahertz for example and then there is a divide by two that drives the both of the mixers Now you may ask why did they have a divide by two well I was gonna make that into a quiz but I'm just gonna tell you anyways for sake of completeness the reason they divide by two is because they want to get the quadrature signal in order to drive the quadrature IQ modulator and demodulators of this system and by using a static divider you can get quadrature signals and there's another PLL that drives directly the digital baseband and that digital baseband has the ADCs and DACs in it that's why the PLL is necessary plus all the digital processing that follows all the DACs and ADCs so this entire section over here is the radio uh, section I will include digital baseband as part of the radio really because you need it in order for uh, the signal to become digital then it can be processed by the DSP the entire Mac layer the physical Mac layer and the Wi-Fi and all the other stuff that will be required everything that's in the physical layer is also on the chip and the CPU is there so now you can implement uh, the soft layers of the that are required for communicating with the Wi-Fi for example and the sequencers accelerators that are part of the digital section and all the interfaces which would be SPI, GPIO, I2C are also directly embedded on the chip itself which are connected to the CPU there's some SRAM as to be expected that's required for any processor and then the all the main memory the flash memory as we saw the 4 megabit one is external some power management circuit bias, bias circuitry and the crystal I'm not sure why they put the crystal over here uh, is also part of this chip so you can see there's so much stuff here but nowadays these things are so trivial pretty much anyone can make them uh, because they've been around for so long and if you go ahead and take a look you can see that this actually does support uh, all the way up to BG and N protocols and in the uh, 802.11b mode at 2.4 gig you can put out 19.5 dBm which is a significant amount of power and it will allow us to uh, reach further in that case now remember that uh, in these type of powers being generated in CMOS there's definitely digital predistortion and calibration circuitry which are all part of the radio so that kind of concludes sorry I pretty sure I spoke really fast but I'm sure you can go back and listen to it if you miss something but I really am a big fan of understanding what it is that you're using and taking a look at the block diagrams not just for the sake of learning but it's important to understand what it is that you're programming and using just downloading some code into it having it to work that really is not electrical engineering that's just programming nothing wrong with that it's just not electrical engineering so having said that let's go ahead and power this on and let me show you what I've built first and then I'm gonna go back and tell you exactly how everything works together well after having said all of that how do I get this thing to talk to this thing? Well, 
if they're both on the internet, then they can talk to each other through the internet. So what we need is a server running on some computer somewhere in the world that has a software that talks to both of these guys at the same time. And someone's already done that. There's a program called Blink, and that server is not actually in the United States, but it's running somewhere in the world. And then you're able to download that app on your phone, and then this app has little widgets on it. And these widgets then send commands to the Blink server. And those commands can then be interpreted by the Wi-Fi module uh, of the ESP, which is also on the internet. So there's several different layers of software running at the same time. There's a layer of software that connects this to the Wi-Fi, and there's a layer of software that then connects this to the internet, and then there is another layer of software which then allows this module to talk to the Blink server. And similarly over here, there is an app which then talks to the Blink server, and this is how these guys eventually communicate to each other by sending messages back and forth between them. So the little widgets over here can send individual commands to the server which are then connected to this guy and this guy receives them and then you can take actions when those commands happen and vice versa you can initiate a command over here which then bounces off the server, comes back to your phone and then does something on the screen over here. All of these are handled uh, simultaneously through the cloud and well how do these guys actually find each other? Well the Blink and network is fixed. It has an IP address so you can connect to it with anything. So this guy talks to a fixed IP address and this guy talks to a fixed IP address and there is an authentication code that's generated and by putting the authentication code in your code then you can have this guy talk to this app directly. And if I give you my authentication code, then you can control my hardware using your phone uh, through the Blink server from anywhere in the world. This is amazing because you can build some really cool and powerful things. You can build a little uh, mechanical game in your room that someone else can play from around the world. That's pretty awesome. So I'm going to give you a, a quick look over here to, to show you what I've built and we'll take a look at how the widgets work uh, on this um, Blink software and then I'll show you the, the Arduino code and then you should be set. Alright, so let's take a look over here. Now as I said this Blink uh, server doesn't run in the United States. Uh, it runs somewhere else and this morning uh, the, the ping to the server was really good but now the ping has slowed down at night time. I'm not sure why. Maybe there are more users on it. But anyway, you have to limit the number of commands that you send to the Blink server. Otherwise it will be overwhelmed and it will disconnect you. So here I have built a couple of little uh, modules that you can see. Actually, let me show you the, the talk about the hardware a little bit over here. I have a temperature sensor over here, which is a one wire um, temperature sensor. Very, very easy and straightforward to communicate to the libraries for that are already available. At the same time, I'm taking the voltage from the battery and I'm feeding it back onto the ADC of the board as well. And this allows me to actually monitor the battery voltage right over here directly on my phone so that if I'm away and I notice that the battery is getting low or something's going wrong, I can always shut it down remotely. And at the same time, I have this RGB LED matrix, which is like the NeoPixel, uh, which I've done a tutorial on before, all the way over here. And this thing continues on outside of the screen for a few more LEDs. It's a 60 LED strip, and they're all connected uh, at the same time. So I should be able to control the color and the number of LEDs that are on uh, as well. So now if you look at the screen on my phone, you can see that I'm getting the temperature of the room live. This says 25.2 degrees Celsius, and that's indeed the temperature. And if I put my finger on the temperature sensor, you should be able to see, you can see that the temperature indeed does go up. So this is a live measurement of that temperature. And I can read that from anywhere as long as I'm connected to the internet. At the top left over here, I have a little widget that shows the trying to get an angle where you can actually read it easier. There you go, I have a temp, I have a, a, the, um, in millivolts the voltage of the battery, so you can see it says 4030, so the battery voltage is at 4.03 uh, volts. That's also pretty nice and straightforward. I also have a little button over here, and if I play, uh, press the button, the little LED that's on the um, board can be turned on. So here we go, let's press that. There you go, you can see the little green LED turn on, and I can turn it off, turn it on, and turn it off. And I can do that uh, very nicely and I can start lighting up the strips by, ha I have this slider um, widget over here, so let's slide it a little bit forward. There you go, it's at four, now it turns on uh, four of the LEDs, I can slide a little bit further and you can see that it continues to turn on more and more of them. I can change the color of the strip, let's try something in the red, there we go, we can try something green, like that, and something blue like that. It's got this little RGB zebra <laughs> unusual thing that uh, sets the colors and I can go back to 
setting it to white. Now if I were to slide this all the way to the end and turn on all the LEDs, there will be a drain on the battery, so you should be able to see the battery voltage drop. You can go all the way to the end. So now all the lights are going to turn on, and if you take a look, you can see that the battery voltage now uh, dropped to 3.9, 3.89 or so. And if I go all the way back to zero and turn off all the LEDs once again, if this thing would actually do what I'm asking it, again this server has become really really slow, I'm not sure why. There you go, you can see that I just got disconnected and it's going to connect right back up again. This is a, an unusual problem that's been happening in the evening, it was actually running really nicely. But not to worry, you can actually run your own local Blink server because the code is free and you can download and run it on your computer. You can have your own little uh, Blink server, you can do as, send as much data as you want and I'm sure it will be much much faster than the, uh, than the Blink server. Right now the ping of the Blink uh, server is uh, almost 900 milliseconds, which is really, really, really bad. And this is why it's uh, acting a little bit slow. But other than that, it works really, really well. I'm thoroughly impressed with how easy it is to put this together. So let me give you an idea of how these widgets actually work. So for example, this widget right over here, let's take a look at uh, this button, which is the simplest one, and you can tell it, uh, give the button a name, and you can say, what do you want to control with the button? Right now I'm controlling GP5, which is one of the general purpose IOs that's connected to the LED. That's all that's needed. You don't even need to write the code for that. And so whenever I push the button, this will send the command to GP5, and it will turn the GP5 from low to high, and that's why the LED uh, is turned on. Something a little bit more complicated, for example, we have here a display. So this display is connected to different types of pins. So you can have analog, digital, uh, or virtual pins. And virtual pins are like variables. So these variables allows you to write something directly to the variable, and that variable then can be adjusted. So what I'm doing on the PC side is I'm writing to the virtual pin V1, and that virtual pin V1, the value of that will then be displayed directly on this widget, and that the value of that is the temperature itself. So really, really is easy and straightforward. I highly recommend you download this just to play with it and familiarize yourself with it. But the really main concept that I want to get across is that you can communicate with virtual pins as well as I.O. pins directly from here. So that's how you can pass variables back and forth between this app and the Arduino. And you can use those virtual pins for that. So you can do pretty much anything. So for example, this guy over here, I'm connecting it to virtual port 3 and has a value between 0 to 60. So when I slide this forward, that will then send the value that this guy has onto the variable V3 back to the Arduino. And that's how I can control uh, precisely what, how many LEDs uh, are on and off. So really, really uh, nice and easy. I, I'm actually going to try and run my own local server because this thing is driving me crazy with the fact that uh, the ping is, is so slow. But really, really, really fun to play with. So let's take a look at the code. Here we are and what I'm doing here is I'm monitoring through the serial port the communication with the module itself and you can see that it's connecting to cloud.blink.cc at this port and you see the ping is really really slow 881 millisecond it's not because my internet is slow my download speeds are, are really really fast more than 100 megabits per second so this is definitely not the not because of that and in the morning the ping was really good it was only three or four millisecond and I'm not sure what happened uh, during the day but this allows us to monitor any, any serial activity that comes out of the module itself. And remember, you need an FTDR in order to program it. So here's the code. This is the entire code, all of it over here. And it's very, very easy and really straightforward. So I'm going to briefly go through it. At the top here, you have this blink print command, which allows you uh, allows the software to print out information like this when it's restarting and so on. So it's nice to have that. Then I define all my ports. So my ADC input port is connected to A0, my LED port is uh, 5, my temperature sensor bus is on port 4, and this uh, LED strip is on port 12. Here I'm saying how many LEDs I have. I have 60 LEDs. And here are the main libraries I'm using. Obviously the ESP8266 uh, Wi-Fi library. This is a stack that allows you to connect to a Wi-Fi network. And this Blink sim uh, simple ESP8266 is the software required for this uh, module to be able then to talk to the Blink server. So this connects to the Wi-Fi, this connects to the Blink server, has all the information to be able to communicate to the Blink server. 
This simple timer is a basic interrupt routine uh, functions that are, that are available for you to be able to create basic interrupts. One wire is the one wire communication protocol standard. The Dallas temperature is a type of uh, temperature sensor that I'm using. Uh, the Adafruit NeoPixel is, as I mentioned, the NeoPixel LED strip protocol for that, and the STDLIB is used for some uh, parsing of strings. This is my authentication code. This code is given to you by the Blink app, and then you copy that back onto your code, and this is how the Blink server will recognize your hardware and be able to connect your phone to your hardware with a unique authentication code. So this code is for uh, mine that I generated from the, the app. Then everything else is just basic code. We are uh, initializing, we're creating an object for uh, this simple timer, an object for the one wire, uh, an object for the Dallas temperature sensor, all then of course an object for the NeoPixel LED strip. These are di different libraries being creating an object for those libraries in order for us to be able to control those pieces of hardware. Here I'm storing my LED colors and how many of the LEDs on the strip are turned on. This function over here just turns on a certain number of uh, LEDs in my LED strip. So you can see that there's two loops in it. Uh, from uh, It goes all the way to the strip on number. So let's say if the strip on number is 10, it will turn on the first uh, 10 LEDs to the color that I have selected up, up over here. And for the rest of them, it turns them off. So every time I call this uh, light uh, strip function, it will turn on as many LEDs uh, that are indicated by this variable over here. Again, really straightforward. And here's my interrupt function. So every time this interrupt function is called is where I'm going to do all my uh, data collection. So I'm going to talk to the A to D. I'm going to get the value of the A to D. I'm going to store that. I'm going to request the temperature from the temperature sensor. I'm going to get that value in degrees Celsius. And I'm going to convert it to a string. And I'm going to put the variable C after it so that it says C for Celsius. And then I use the Blink virtual write command. This is all the command that is needed to actually talk to the Blink uh, server itself. So this will then initialize, in, initiate a whole bunch of functions that are stored in the Blink simple uh, library and that then talks to the Wi-Fi library and that's how the whole uh, connection is made. So here I'm writing to virtual port 0 which was the virtual port that was displaying my battery voltage, which was the ADC value. And I'm also writing to a virtual port 1, which was what was uh, showing the temperature. So in my Blink app, I have selected uh, this that particular widget to have the value 0 as being the virtual uh, variable that it's talking to, and the other one having a 1 as being the virtual variable. And then I light the strip depending on what it is. And at the same time, this is how I send data to my app and here is how I get data from my app. Whenever you touch a widget that has an indicated uh, in let's say virtual variable v2 then this function gets this macro function gets initiated. So the, because there is a live connection between the module and the Blink server as soon as you touch one of those widgets that has the virtual variable v2 or v3 this function will run and it will grab the data from the app and it will store it into variables that are running locally on the microprocessor. So this one right over here is the Zebra RGB. When I touch it, it will grab the variables uh, red, green, and blue, and it will store them into the LED colors. And this V3 was the sliding widget. Whenever I touch that, it's going to grab uh, the number of the slide, whatever it is, between 0 to 16, and it's going to store it over here. And then here, in the setup, I'm going to initialize the different things that uh, are used on the uh, microprocessor here I will start a serial port and here's another blink command this will then connect you directly to the Wi-Fi uh, that has a certain SSID and a certain password obviously I've removed mine which are my private network at home and you can uh, you'd have to put your own variables in its place and then using the the thing authentication which is this guy over here it will then connect the Blink server and it will establish itself as an object on the Blink server and that's how the communication is disclosed. Here I am initializing my interrupt function every 250 milliseconds. I begin the temperature sensor object, I begin this LED strip object. These are straightforward Arduino uh, commands. And then in the actual main function of the processor that's always running, I continue to run the Blink a function that keeps the connection alive and I continue to run my interrupt every time it expires. And that's it. That's all it is there to see everything that I did on my phone, be able to control the lights, read the temperature, read my battery voltage, change the color of the, the lights. All of that is handled 
through this really, really simple code. And I've written it in, in a very simple way. I'm sure it can be optimized. I'm not spending that much time to optimize it, but as you can see how easy and straightforward it is. But I want to emphasize it's really important to understand how this works and how these layers of software are talking to each other and what is happening in the background, even if it's just a global understanding is better than not knowing what's going on. And this is what this was the whole point of making this video because I wanted to get you excited about understanding the background of how these things are working. So I'm going to uh, right now try and run the a blink server on my own computer and if I succeed I'll let you know but if you enjoyed the video please let me know I'm very curious if these type of videos are also of interest and uh, I'm gonna look for the command look for your uh, comments in the section if you have any uh, comments or questions let me know I'm gonna try and answer them and I will post this code on my website and I will also post the code for the RGB LED matrix which I've been putting off and haven't had a chance to put that up I will also post that as well so you can download that for the FPGA which was a different episode so I hope you enjoyed it I'll see you next time.